is it two releases now, or maybe longer. Uh, my talk is specifically about the user-facing part of it. So I'm not going into the details of the VMM kernel implementation, because that's mostly Mike Larkin's work anyway, and I only barely understand what he does there. So, when I made the slide, I figured out I had these last talks about the cloud networking stack and OpenBSD, and now with VMD, I, I can talk about the cloud stack and OpenBSD. So it's actually part three of a series, um, unintentionally. So what is VMD? VMD is a daemon responsible for the execution of virtual machines. That's the definition in the, in the manual page. It, it is a process that runs, that um, reads the configuration, executes VMs, interfaces with the kernel driver, the VMM uh, driver, to set everything up to have like the the CPU assisted virtualization of Intel and AMD CPUs and all that. So VMD basically does all the, the maintenance and the device layer of these virtual machines. And VMD is something that you can actually compare in some ways with QMU, the model of of uh, VMD is very similar to, to QMU and KVM, where you have a kernel driver and then a device layer that, that runs uh, in, in user land. But we wanted to provide something that is very simple uh, to use, but also from the code and the functionality, easier, cleaner, um, something that can be in our base system. So it's also a license issue, but it's Definitely not everything. Um, and it's designed in a way that fits into OpenBSD. And actually, we also wanted to have our own implementation because OpenBSD is a, is a research project as well. And it's sometimes good to try something new to get experience. So it's not always that, well, we have to do one solution or the other. It's we use VMD to experiment, to implement our ideas how we can implement a hypervisor in OpenBSD. So what's the history? If Mike Larkin wrote the VMM uh, driver, actually he started some years ago, um, I don't quite remember, but it was a hackathon we had in Berlin and we had beer and, and he showed me like a few lines of a D message from a virtual machine uh, from the host where it said like VMM monitor attaching, initializing EPT and so on. And I was like, wow, you're running this on OpenBSD? What is that? Did you port anything? And then he said, well, I'm working on this. But he didn't want to share it with anyone at this time. I, only a few people were actually even involved that something is going on there. Um, but I promised him to help him with this, with the userland part. And I really wanted to have this in OpenBSD because I use virtualization all the time. And it is so painfully annoying that the hosts are not running on OpenBSD, right? It's, it's just every time I run a VM that runs on something else, it it's just reminds me how bad it is to run on anything else. And QMU and OpenBSD without hardware acceleration is not really an option for me. It might be useful for testing, but for two reasons. I don't like the QMU configuration. I never get used to it, and it's just slow. So I was really excited about this work. and. Uh, some time later, it might be, I don't know, one or two years or something like this. It was a long time. Um, thank you, Henning. Secrets? Not here, please. <laughs> oh. 
small coffee break. Um, so sometime later, Mike Larkin showed up with, with uh, the first code that he shared, and um, he had an initial implementation of a very simple user lent VMD. And with his permission, I basically jumped on it and turned it into a privilege separated daemon. I added a pass y like a configuration file and so on. And yeah, and then I started working on this. And I added a, a tool, VMCTL. There was something, but I yeah, kept some parts that, was, that were hardware specific that basically to have Mike's area and did all the like the, the configuration, the, the proof set and all that and redid most of this. So an overview of what I'm talking about today is VMD, it's tool VMCTL, the VMMCI, the control interface, metadata, something that's not an obvious base but also useful, and the VMM itself is all out of scope. So the virtual machine daemon. Um, that is the typical precept diagram that we tend to show for our demons. So VMD itself is consists of multiple processes. You run it, you run VMD, user SBIN VMD, and then it executes uh, initially, like uh, three processes. The one is called control, another one priv, and a third one VMM. Actually, we used to fork these processes, but um, in the in the last release, we we changed the model of our priv to actually execute these uh, processes. So it. It's a whole different story, but actually it improves uh, the protection against certain attacks. Uh, the, the address space is randomized again when, when you execute. You're not sharing anything with the parent. And with VMD, it was very easy because it basically was designed from the beginning to support this model. So it starts up, it has VMD and these three other processes. The VM CTL tool is an external tool that can talk to the control process via the Unix socket. Um, VMD itself, the parent process is, is, has a few privileges to open files on, on the disk, um, like the configuration, but also tab network interfaces, um, disk images, and so on. And once it has opened these disk images, it can send them via the iMessage socket to the VMM process. That's not the kernel part, that's uh, the name of a process in VMD as well. And the VMM process itself doesn't uh, have, uh, is unprivileged, is pledged, and doesn't have access to the file system. So it cannot open anything. It doesn't have the permissions to open disk images and so on. But it can r run virtual machines. Each virtual machine is a process of its own. And so VMM runs the virtual machines and passes it all the necessary file descriptors for like the disk, the console, and the network interfaces. So one, one nice model that you see here already is that the virtual machines themselves cannot open any files on the disk because they're uh, like in this change rotate pledged uh, yeah, environment. But um, there's another process that does it, passes the file descriptor. Um, VMM, the parent, and the, each virtual machine communicate with the kernel via IOCTLs. And this is done all the time, like a virtual machine handles is uh, exits for via IOCTL. So it runs something, when there's an exit, the, the kernel triggers it, the uh, virtual machine uh, runs it and, and handles like the device I.O., for example. Um, so the, the interface 
between kernel and virtual machines is in this. I'm not sure if you can read it, this uh, part between VMs and the VMM. The VMM only has the responsibility of starting, stopping, and uh, listing VMs, maybe, if you have to do it as well. And the, the VMs themselves, they do all the I.O. And, and run the actual machines. One very important thing of um, VMD is that it is designed in a way that we really, uh, well, I, I would say mitigate. Of course, we cannot be 100% per sure, but the model is really, really sane. We avoid the possibility of, of so-called VM escapes. So, very popular example is the QMU Venom attack. Um, well, there were multiple like this, but a bug in the floppy driver allowed to execute code on the host side from the virtual machine. So the, the virtual machine could trigger a bug. Then suddenly you're on, you're still in this uh, one of these VM processes, like. Let's say in QM, it's, a little, it's of course a different design, but they share something here. So you're in the VM. Um, one part is the actually virtual machine, the, the guest side, and one part is the host side that is running the device layer, the host emulation, and all that. And with the Venom attack, there was a bug in the floppy driver so that you could execute code on the host side of the VM. Or you could get starters from other VMs inject something into other VMs. And actually in, in VMD, each VM process um, runs in a very restricted um, pledged environment. So pledge is our, how would you pronounce it? I, if, I think, if I say capability systems, you would get angry. Um, what is it? Pledge is something on its own, right? <laughs> Okay, so a POSIX subset, basically a restriction subsystem. When you, when you specify pledge, standard I.O. and VMM, then from this point on, this process is only allowed to do the most basic libc functions, like it, it limits the syscalls that the process ca uh, can do. Standard I.O. allows to do like read, write, malloc, very basic thing, but it can, standard I.O. doesn't allow to open files or to, to send traffic or whatever. There's the many, many uh, pledge uh, options. VMM is something that restricts the process to, to do the VMM I.O. CTL, but it cannot do any other I.O. CTL, actually. And even the source codes, all, they're limited to what standard I.O. and VMM allows. Um, the, the VMM process, the one that creates the virtual machines, needs a little bit more. It has received file descriptors, so it can get the file descriptor via iMessage from the parent process, like, like as I said, the disk images and so on. But for example, it cannot send a file descriptor. And proc means it can, it can execute other processes or fork processes. And then there's one trick that is not visible here in the kernel. The kernel detects if the process is the VMM master process, the one that creates the virtual machines, so that one, or it knows if it's like an actual VM. And then the semantics for VMM are different. So that means the VM itself is only allowed to do VMM IO CTLs on its own VM. It cannot even request something from other VMs. It cannot get starters. It cannot create new VMs. So this is uh, something that hopefully <laughs> restricts the process to doing these yeah, side effects that the, the Venom, for example, did. And of course, the process is change routed, running as an unprivileged user ETC. So whenever there's such an 
advise me of another escape, I look at this and say, well, I think it's a, it's a good way, it's a good design, and we see. Uh, if you're able to break it, let us know and we improve it, but um, it's a very interesting model. So the VMD device layer implements several like really old legacy devices. VMD is very limited, so we only have a, a subset of the most uh, important um, hardware devices. Um, so like timer, interrupt controller, a clock, a serial car, a console, um, PCI is there, and then we're using Virtio. Um, but this is enough and then a few other, of course, uh, s even smaller devices. But this is enough to, to run most operating systems that don't need uh, uh, actual graphics uh, VGA. So we, by now we, we can run um, OpenBSD and, and Linux. I tried Plan 9, um, DOS. I didn't try um, Solaris yet. Um, NetBSD works. FreeBSD is work in progress, but FreeBSD had some assumptions that we didn't uh, met, but it will work in, I guess, in the next days. Mike is currently working on fixing FreeBSD support. Um, so that's, that's all we need. And if you say, oh, but also need like an uh, graphics adapter, I need, uh, I don't know, something special, USB, then, then use something else. That's, we might add a few more inter, uh, devices to, to VMD um, that we need to support, like SMP, for example. So we thinking about adding some I ACPI support and so on, but um, it is not like uh, other hypervisors where I have 10 different network interfaces and so on. So it's this simplified, uh, you, you get a request and you send a response and then there's no timeout. So it ve was very simple to implement and the IP address is auto-generated from a prefix. I'm currently using the CGN prefix uh, 100.64 something. It's because I didn't want to uh, conflict with RC1918 here. And so when you have enabled forwarding, the effect will be the, your, your host site interface has an IP address, the guest has one, the guest uses the, the host as a default gateway, and then everything else is like standard NAT and routing. No, it's just a, it's a, boot P has a limited, like a subset of options, actually. Yeah, but that's a standard option. Uh, the next server, right? The, yeah, that was in boot P already, yeah. Yeah, next server, but uh, setting the file name to auto-install, so the auto-installer will click in automatically. That is currently not done. Um, yeah, it could probably work. I would consider it as a feature, but on the other side, we have auto install in OpenBSD. So yeah, it yeah, but could make sense. Yeah. Just triggered by that DSV reply. That's the point. No. Yes, it is. Yeah. Ah, it's triggered by the. If you send a DSV reply containing the file name yeah. option, set to auto install, the auto installer will start. It will be started automatically. Okay. That's, that's my point. So all we would need is a way to turn this auto install on, basically. Well, it should not be on by default, but uh, if you need it, then, yeah. Not yet. Yeah, if we turn it on by default, I don't know how like a random Linux also behaves. Uh, but uh, yeah, it could be useful, definitely. Um, we found one case where boot P was not supported, and um, I, I didn't try it myself, but Mike tried to boot an Android image on it. And he's <laughs> but Android is too cool for, for boot P, so. <laughs> <coughs> uh, 
Warm the users in groups. That's also a very interesting thing. Um, is it useful? I don't know. I use it. Some people uh, experience with it. And over time, we will see how much sense it makes. There are definitely a few parts missing right now to make it even better. But you can pre-configure a VM that doesn't work from the command line and set an owner. So it's either a user or a group. And then this owner can um, start and stop the VM or attach to the console. So this makes sense if you have, I don't know, you want to give someone access to the console on your machine uh, without giving like root access, right? Um, so you pre-configure the VM, and then these commands are allowed. Usually a user cannot access to your VM's uh, console by default. The missing part here is uh, a way basically to, to basically provide a, disk, a default disk image, let's say like a system-wide disk image, and then allow any user to run it and then maybe do some kind of copy on write that you, you have this master disk image and the user just starts it and has changes on this or something like this. So the disk image is uh, the part that is the limitation here. BIOS actually in the, in the abstract that is on the BSD CAN website, it, I still wrote VME doesn't support BIOS and we only support booting open BSD. This has been changed. We do support BIOS now. So that means that we can boot all the other operating systems. So you can run Linux on OpenBSD, for example. Um, there's one problem, and there are different approaches to handle this, that there's no BSD-licensed BIOS out there. Our solution was quite practical. We consider it as, as firmware, so we Create a port, we compile the, the C BIOS and SGA BIOS combination, and it creates a binary blob, and then we already have this mechanism in OpenBSD of ETC firmware. That basically means some device drivers need, need a firmware that cannot be distributed with the base system. But when you install OpenBSD, it runs FW update and FW updates detects which devices are there that need a firmware and fetches them as a package from, from, our, from a separate FTP um, server. So we, we ship the BIOS as a, as a firmware, actually, and it's a single file. Um, in practice, you will always have this. Uh, if you install OpenBSD on an internet-connected machine, it's installing this automatically. If you have a <coughs> machine that is somehow not connected to the internet, you have to make sure that you get the VMM firmware package and, and install it. And then it boots, and the BIOS does everything that we need to run, the standard bootloaders and, and other operating systems. SGI BIOS is um, only useful for the bootloader. It, um, yeah, it emulates a VGA adapter on the serial console. But as soon as the kernel takes over and you're not doing BIOS calls anymore, this stops working. VMCDL. So VMCDL is a control tool um, where you can start virtual machines, stop them, uh, list the starters, and there are several different uh, subcommands. And different to other CTL tools in OpenBSD, this is not in the Cisco CLI style. My, my first version was, and some, some people, and I think Zero as well, complained, and I changed it to, the, to a simple get op, opt style. But I will insist that the get opt, the command line options here, remain simple. And I don't want uh, long options, right? I think there's even a uh, man page where the, the get, get sub options or long options. Sub options are really nice. You, you see it in QMU. I think BIF has it as well, where you have a column separated list, like you, you, you're working with like CSVs, so something you, you usually do in Excel and not in a configuration. Um, so I'm 
the system to add any more complicated settings. But okay, a simple flag and then something here, 512 megs of memory, three interfaces, the disk image in dash C is like connect to the console when, when it starts up. Um, the status tool, of course, this output is going to change. We already decided, and I just didn't have time yet, uh, for most users, uh, the, the PID of the VM process is not that important. Um, so we, we change it a little bit. And when you, the, as a second step, when you do VM CTL starters, my VM, you will get some more information, maybe like it's assigned IP address and all that. This is, um, the current status is, is like this, but it, it, it will be uh, Im improved before the next release. Um, yeah, you can attach to a running machine to the console. Um, this VMCTL create command just creates a sparse disk image at the moment. We're thinking about renaming it from create to something else because uh, people think create means create a new virtual machine, but it actually just creates a uh, a, a sparse disk image. It's something that you could theoretically do with DD and some options. Uh, that's what the VMCTL create does. And some other commands, load, reload, reset, lock. Send and receive is not in VMD yet, but um, it's work in progress. It's already working. I tested it. It has some bugs, but it's working. So, so we will get migration and possibly even live migration in, in VMD. It has been designed to support this from the beginning and um, what you can do at the moment is like these commands here, you, you send the status of the running uh, VM, it just dumps it to standard out so you can pipe it into a file. Um, then the VM is, is uh, stopped or and then later you can receive, that means just you pipe in the file and the VM will start, uh, continue running. So if you have like a, anything you did, it's like hibernating it basically. But the nice thing is you can also, if you have two identical VMDs at the moment, you can pipe it over an SSH connection. we we'll send over the VM. Currently it's not a live migration, so it stops the VM while it's copying and then once it's done, um, the VM starts on the other side. So this is um, something very useful, actually. Of course, there are some more things to consider. How, uh, for example, how do we handle the fact um, when there are like two incompatible CPUs on the on the two hosts? Um, and another thing is like the live migration is just an algorithm. The way how you send. The, the, the memory to the other side. Currently we just halt the VM, dump the memory and then start once it's done, but you can copy the, the unused pages and then have an algorithm to basically narrow it down and when you um, reach a certain threshold, you flip over. So you, this is something that you have like in vMotion, for example, where you, it just feels like you, you're still, uh, using uninterrupted, maybe that's a short blip and then, then uh, it's running on the other side. And this is just an algorithm, it's nothing m much more complicated than the current uh, dumping. VNMCI is something that I wrote, it's uh, um, at the moment, since we don't have ACPI support, um, we don't have a way to shut down VMs gracefully. So we, all we can do is like turn off the power, basically. And when you didn't do <laughs> a shutdown on the VM, then you have a problem. So um, that was the main reason, but VMMCI also allows us to add some other features that you find in um, 
VMware tools, for example, things like that. So it's a different protocol, but the concept is the same. So it, it adds a communication channel between the, the host and the guest, and then the, the host can request, okay, please shut down gracefully now, and then the VM starts like the shutdown scripts and everything. Or uh, it provides a um, time counter, for example. Um, that's all at the moment, but it, it could add a few more things that you find in Zen, Hyper-V, uh, and VMware, for example. Uh, Hyper-V also has a heartbeat. I'm not sure if this is useful, but things like that. Um, so that's why we added this, but it's only available for OpenBSD guests at the moment. So if somebody wants to to use this on Linux to improve the shutdown behavior on Linux, have fun and implement a Linux driver for it. Other stuff. Um, metadata is something that is not in OpenBSD. I put it on uh, GitHub because I'm, um, I was deploying virtual machines to, to AWS. So as a story, we did all the work to, to make OpenBSD running in, in Amazon, right? And in IWS or in the cloud, you have this auto-provisioning and they don't use auto-install. They, they have uh, pre-installed VMs, when they, but when they start up this pre-installed default VM image, uh, you somehow have to give it your SSH public key, for example. So once it's started, you want to log in. Or um, user data is a way to pass it some configuration. Uh, Ubuntu, for example, uses cloud init, and cloud init is kind of a YAML configuration file, and then you can configure the, the system with it. And this is kind of a standard. It's not just in AWS. It's also in, in OpenStack and CloudStack, and all these stacks out there. Um, only Azure works a little bit different. So I said, OK, I want to test the same images that I deploy to AWS. I want to test them with VMM. And for that, I need something that provides this cloud init functionality. And uh, cloud init itself, or this, this, we call it EC2 init, is basically the VM starts up and makes an HTTP request to a pre defined IP address in the like 169 range. And then it simply fetches 169 something the IP address slash later slash something open SSH key. And then the, the, the web server returns the open SSH key. So this is a defined key value set based on a, on a URL on a, on a fixed server. And of course, it's a bit tricky because the, the server, when it gets the request, it has to know the, the, the related VM. So metadata is, is written in C and KCGI. And when it gets a request, it, it, it gets the IP address and then it looks up the VM by doing some IO, CTLs, and so on on, on, the, on the host machine. And then it has a directory where it, it just finds a VM by name and, and it values and it returns it. So with, with this metadata server, I can run uh, these cloud images from Ubuntu, for example, and our own stuff as well. Um, yeah, we will probably make a package for it. it. As I said, it depends on KCGI from Christops. So it's something that would live in, in ports. Actually, when I started working on VMD and this, uh, uh, people kept on mentioning Firefox, Firefox and Firefox, uh, because we, we did some uh, efforts in OpenBSD to, to maintain Firefox our port, to make it more secure, to handle like W, X or X, and, and, and all this. But Firefox keeps on being like, like the risk, right? So, of course, uh, running Firefox in a VM is something that people like. Uh, I experimented a little bit with it. So I install like two VMs. You could probably also just use one. I use two. One is the Firefox VM. 
One is a firewall VM. It's just a separate tiny OpenBSD with PF and all that. Uh, you could also do it in the host directly. And then when I started, well, I experimented. So either using X forwarding or VNC. VNC is a bit faster, but the VNC server is scary. Uh, X11 VNC, right? Um, so there's no clean solution for that yet, but it works actually. So we see there's more experimenting happening, and if you have ideas, just try it. But we we will uh, think about this a little bit further. Now you can run Docker on OpenBSD, and. It sounds funny, but somebody really did it and wrote an article about this. Well, it's not Docker on OpenBSD. It's somewhere, there's a layer in between. It's an important one. I s isn't it the same way how, how Docker ported uh, Docker to, um, to the Mac, to OS X? They use a little uh, shim, which is like, I think, Linux and um, these OCaml kernel. What's the name? Oh, I don't know. So, um, and of course, instead of using like Alpine Linux, you could probably also use Linux Kit, which is this like very limited Linux layer and run it and run Docker. I don't know why you want to do that, but it's, uh, people have a strong need. At least many you can tell your management, yes, of course, Docker runs on OpenBSD, and then you get your OpenBSD boxes approved at work, right? So. <laughs> Yeah. Quite frankly, you can run anything that is cool and hot at the moment in on OpenBSD now. Only if you support Windows inside. Yeah, we don't do that. Okay, not <laughs> cool and hot, right? So, <laughs> to do. Um, I didn't fill in the list because, as you see, I, I, I posted an abstract, and most what I wrote in the abstract is obsolete because we have BIOS, we can run Linux, and so on. But there's definitely a long to-do list. So my most important to-do at the moment is to make it more stable. There are some certain conditions where VMCTO start and stop, don't work, and your VM doesn't, term, doesn't terminate gracefully or something like that. So um, there's for now, features are fine, but um, it, it, it has to be stable and uh, yeah, awesome OpenBSD quality. And there's a bit more work, but this this uh, evolves quickly, actually. Um, there's lots of to do on the on the VMM side. Um, um, Mike is making changes. I. I, I it's hard to follow them, so we have uh, working AMD support, for example, now. Um, he, he just fixed free, uh, FreeBSD uh, support. Um, SMP is a big part for me, so I have a few, let's say, semi-production semi servers that run on virtual machines, but the host is not OpenBSD, and as I said, it's a pain, and I want to replace them as soon as possible. But I need uh, multiple CPUs to, to replace them. The performance is uh, something that is also being worked on. The device layer of the networking and the block interfaces is uh, um, re-implemented in a way that it's run like uh, asynchronously and so on. So it will be much faster, hopefully. Um, there are many other things, and we're working on getting the send and receive uh, patches ready and in. As I mentioned, this is a, a group of students, um, and Mike Larkin is actually their professor, and he's advising them. There's no priority, no. No, no. Um, I think zero, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but 
things might change after a few years or so, but at the moment we said we, we don't really need this now. So, you know. um, You yourself said you needed like a USB key for the Windows software for your bookkeeping system, but I guess without Windows support, that's a little bit. But there was a use case provided by you for a USB test. Yes, we, we, yeah, that's a horrible thing, but. <laughs> it is, right. <laughs> Yeah, it's German uh, accounting software that you have to use as a company that runs only on Windows with this USB dongle. But anyway, um, we're not planning to support Windows because Windows needs more devices. It needs um, a graphics uh, emulation and so on. But here the trick is that um, you have the kernel interface VMM, and it's related dev VMM interface. And there's work, actually people started and stopped, nobody really finished it, but uh, it's possible, and that's what we want to do, that you, we make it possible to run QMU instead of VMD. So if you don't care about like uh, VM escapes or security or the configuration and all that, but you need Windows, you can run QM you know, or maybe whatever, like Beehive or something like that. It doesn't really matter as long as somebody makes work. We don't really care because we, we will not put this into the base system. But the idea is, for example, that you can do package at QMU, it supports VMM, and then you just run it instead of VMD. Yeah. That's true, that's true. So if you need these fancy devices, uh, then you run QMU. Some people still use QMU on OpenBSD, for example, because it provides more ways to test certain things. Uh, I'm not talking about the ARM emulation or things like that, but like the real um, QMU has more options. So QMU will still be used, and we're not aiming to be uh, feature compatible with QMU. That's not our goal. The goal is basically you run VMs, OpenBSV VMs, maybe Linux VMs, you run some servers, or you, you do some interesting things on, um, on your local system, um, like the Firefox VM. And we're using it to experimenting with certain uh, features. Um, the last weeks, there were some crazy ideas about like experimenting with CPU extensions and so on. To, protecting the memory, and so on. So there, there are many things that we can do in VMD. And yeah, somebody needs to finish the QMU port. I'm not sure if anyone is actively working it at the moment, but it was started before, actually. More questions? I take it you've not tried to run any really exotic operating systems like OS2 or? Plan 9. Oh, Plan 9. And I gave up when I didn't know how to log in, but uh, it booted. <laughs> 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 what are your issue with Firefox and Pegasus? Uh, take the X4 is just not an issue other than that Firefox. It's just very slow. I don't know how to make it fast. I rarely use it. But if you run. There's no change to native. The what? No change to native. So in other words, it's slower. It's slower. Yeah, yeah. But it's even slower. Than <laughs> <laughs> I can see one area for this, you know, not, not as a developer as an end user, whenever something doesn't work, I'm told try it on current. And I can say, oh great, I don't have to upgrade my main machine to current. I can just do a VM. But is that helpful or worse in the sense of if you're doing bug reports? Yeah. Do you, oh. do you prefer bare metal, bare metal versus possibly introducing VMM bugs? in the middle of that one for you? Um, <laughs> 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 yes. Well, it's hard to answer. Just let's, let's say maybe I'm answering something different. But in general, OK, we all agree virtual machines have a risk. And bare, bare metal is, is the safest thing to do, but on the other hand, bad metal these days, you're most likely running on some kind of proprietary hypervisor anyway, right? Um, but so a VM 
gives us, and that's, that's the amazing thing I realized recently after this discussions that I heard like from CEO and so on, allows us to experiment with things that bare metal wouldn't do. For example, if we're the host, we can add like certain hardware restrictions basically or emulate them and even protect the VMs in a way that the, the host could not do. So um, I never really thought about this before, but it gives us the opportunity to even strengthen the security of the virtual machines. And for testing VMs, what if your host is, is uh, you need to restart them. I hope that the send receive works soon so that you can store your uh, state and then switch the, the, the host and upgrade, for example, or you copy them over and then continue. You, you need probably you need to use iSCSI or NFS to store the, the uh, disk images in a shared space. Um, and we need to make it yeah, more stable, actually. Uh, one more thing, VMM will also support nested uh, operation. Um, Mike had, had it running already up to like, I don't know, he tested, I think, four, four levels of like VMM and, and VMM and VMM and so on. Um, but it's currently not enabled. I think there was, there was a bug that shows up in, after the third or fourth iteration. Any other questions? There is a QXL driver for Spice VDI that I believe is BSD licensed. I haven't tested it in X11 on BSD or the BSD, but there may be a way to get the viewer in one of your desktop planes to interact with your BSD or Linux VMs when you're running X11 on a BSD pretty easily. And that's supposed to be much quicker than something like BSD. Yeah. If the code is sane and all that, maybe. Um, it's coming from uh, Red Hat Linux. <laughs> yeah. I have a question to the crowd. Who is using Wagrant? Wagrant? Nobody? Not yet. Why not yet? Uh, I'm kind of parking uh, VMM or VMD as a Vagrant provider, so you could use Vagrant on OpenBSD for all the That's why we're not using Vagrant. You haven't finished the course. <laughs> 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 See you next year. <laughs> 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 okay, thanks. I would say uh, I use Packer, uh, but not Vagrant. And I thought it was easier just to wire in a whole bunch of PDM shell scripts. Yeah, but uh, that's not the point here. Yeah. See, I'm a purist. I prefer if we use the tools, VMCTL, VMConf, and all that. But as Philip convinced me, there's definitely a point for Vagrant, if you, for example, if you want to have one VM that works on multiple platforms and, and all that. And so we... we yes, yes. Uh, one way to do it, a simple way, is this metadata thing, but there are much more sophisticated things, actually. Yeah. Um, I tried to convince uh, uh, Amazon, why don't you support nested virtualization and we could test VMM running in AWS, but uh, maybe someday we, we can do that. Um, <laughs> wink. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Then I think we're out of time, almost. Thanks. Thing. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I know some of you are happy to support us in the evening when we go to the bar, but please also donate to the project. <laughs> <laughs>